Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 20th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we fit in four issues. Before turning to the top three, we start with a brief discussion of our reaction to Monday's appointment of the new OMB director. Then, Picking up on our top three, we start with the discussion of the results of the PFD working group. Second, now that they appear to have the necessary signatures, we outline our views on the oil tax initiative. And then finally, we take up Ed King's most recent piece, suggesting we've already seen before in the state's history how the current fiscal dynamics play out. And now, let's join Michael. New new session, new day, new OMB director. Where where do you want to start this morning? New OMB director. That's a that's an interesting interesting development yesterday. I didn't anticipate that there was going to be an appointment, um, and I certainly didn't anticipate the uh, the person that was appointed. It's it's sort of like it, it's sort of like the exact opposite of of Donna. Um, it, uh, sort of a nondescript technocrat who, uh, who, who is defining his job as being a nondescript technocrat. And, uh, it's, it, it, it's a, it, it, it's a different look for the administration. And to me, frankly, a surprising look for the administration to be going in that direction. Well, and I thought this whole commentary about apoliticalness was, uh, I mean, I never saw Donna as necessarily being political. I mean, it is an appointed position. You are pushing the uh, the vision of the administration, so I guess there is a bit of politics to it. But I never saw her in there doing anything basically but talking about statistical analysis and saying, you know, spending is taxing, and, and that's kind of how it was. Apparently, that didn't go down well with the legislature. Well, I mean, you elect a governor to to have an agenda. You elect a governor to do something to 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 have a poli- have policies that that uh, that that the governor wants to uh, wants to push forward and and wants to enact. And and you have uh, uh, commissioners of the various departments that uh, ha- that are there to carry out the governor's agenda in in various aspects. And the OMB director is no other is is nothing other than frankly another commissioner. Of another department who has part of the governor's agenda to carry forward. In in the case of <clears throat> in the case of this administration, and given and given our fiscal circumstances, a very important part to, to play right. uh, uh, the spending side uh, of government, which is which is a serious problem. And and I mean I mean she was political in the <clears throat> in the sense that she was carrying forward the governor's agenda uh, on on spending issues. Uh, and was and was at the forefront, as you would expect the head of a department to be at the forefront of of pushing forward the governor's agenda uh, with respect to to bringing spending down. The signal that that this appointment sends is um, is is troubling in the sense that it's I mean the the he, the, the new uh, director is describing his role as being a technocrat, as sort of you know running the calculator or or running the spreadsheet. Um, and and not with a particular uh, agenda uh, to, to bring to the game, and and I think that if that's reflective of what the administration now views the OMB director's role to be, uh, that's very troubling because that's the that's the commissioner in charge of getting spending under control or or keeping spending under control in any administration. Right. Uh, that's what the OMB, OMB director is is in charge of doing. And so I just it's um it, it's a it's a troubling 
it's a troubling appointment. I, I mean, I we had talked about Anna McKinnon on previous shows, and I think Anna McKinnon would have been a troubling, uh, troubling appointment. I think there were there were others certainly out there that that would have been very strong appointments for the for the OMB director and continue uh, the governor's agenda of trying to bring spending under control. Perhaps not as deep a cuts as he proposed in his first uh, first. Uh, uh, go around last year, but but nonetheless, trying to keep spending under control. This this is a um, a, 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 a it, it's it's indicating a direction for the administration um, uh, that uh, is is certainly different from where we were, and and I think frankly troubling uh, in, uh, in in where it indicates the administration might be going. We got about two and a half minutes here, Brad. Uh, give me your your gut. Che- I need a gut check here on the administration. Uh, when I saw this uh, Steiniger's uh, uh, appointment, um, you know, I, I keep thinking that maybe there's a long game being played. That things are going to turn near the end of the session. Some of those things, but the more that I see some of these things happen, uh, I'm getting the hanky feeling. Give me your gut check on, on the direction the administration's going here in the next two minutes. I think the administration, frankly, is withdrawing from the playing field. Um, I think, you know, last year they came in full bore. Uh, they had Donna. They had, uh, uh, they had you know, a, a, a fairly good team uh, put together. Uh, and I think they came in full bore trying to, trying to resolve things. And then, you know, we have the explosions that occurred during the session. We have the recall that's going on now. And I think this is the OMB uh, appointment is an indication that the administration is just sort of they, they've sort of moved their their pieces off the checkerboard. They've they've taken their 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 pile of money out of the poker out of the poker fund and uh, and and just sort of they've they've stacked it off to the side. And and the budget looks a lot like that too. The budget is sort of well, here's the costs. Um, and, uh, and you guys figure out what to do. I want to, I want a full PFD, but you know, that means we've got to drain the CBR, but here, this is all yours legislature. And it's sort of, it's sort of a abdication is probably too strong a word, but, but not by much, um, in terms of how the administration is approaching this. So it's sort of the exact opposite of what they, I mean, the, the comparison between Donna and the new OMB director is, is apt. It's sort of the exact opposite of what the of what the led, of what the administration was doing last year. Last year they were coming in hard charging. This is where we ought to cut. This is what we ought to do. This is how we're going to get ourselves and and sort of like a maybe a little bit like a bull in the china shop trying right. to trying to accomplish all that. Yeah. Th- this year they've just left they've left the building. Let's talk about number 1, uh, the working group of the PFD, the bicameral working group came out with a report which essentially just kind of mirrored everything that happened in this last session. Uh, and maybe gives us a little bit of a precursor to what we should expect in the upcoming session, right? Yeah, I think I think the the the, the objective for the working group when it was originally established was to was to to get a smaller group together to try to be able to come to grips with uh, in an attempt to to come to grips with the various forces at work in the PFD and see if in a smaller working group. Um, uh, perhaps a more cohesive working group, um, a less unwieldy working group. They could they could come to grips with the PFD and and chart a way forward. Uh, it it didn't it didn't achieve that objective. Um, it uh, it sort of mirrored as as you were saying earlier. It sort of mirrored the 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 various positions that the that that per- various people take in the legislature take uh, on the PMB or on the PFD. And I and I've not. I, I, I have I hadn't sensed, and I don't sense in this final report that there was really ever any effort uh, given to, to to bring things together. Click Bishop, who was one of the co-chairs, talked a lot about that uh, at the beginning, but I don't see any results of uh, of of some give and take and some effort to. Uh, to try to to try to bring things together. The only conclusions they reached are in the executive summary. Uh, on page two of the report, uh, and it, and and there's two sentences. Uh, the first sentence is: While agreement on the size of the dividend may still be difficult to attain, members agree that the permanent fund must be protected from inflation, so that future generations of Alaskans may benefit from it. I'm not sure 
inflation proofing was ever was ever an issue but but nonetheless they agree that that, that inflation proofing is is something that that needs to be protected um, and then the second sentence is a majority of members agree that use of permanent fund earnings for state services and dividends must stay within the draw limits established by a structure like the percent of market value law enacted in 2018. Uh, that's a little surprising. I mean, uh, the majority of members uh, uh, piece of it isn't surprising because as we, as you and I have discussed and as we've noted since the outset, uh, the committee was uh, three from the House, three from the, uh, from the Senate, uh, two from the House were uh, well, four, four from the four from the House, four from the Senate, uh, three from the House were uh, were pro PFD cuts, were or right. in favor of PFD cuts, right? Um, and so that made them that made a majority. It was two and two in the Senate that made a majority in favor of PFD cuts. So a majority finding that um, finding something is not surprising. Um, but a majority of members agree to use the permanent fund earnings for state services and dividends must stay within draw limits established by a structure like the percent of market value law enacted in 2018. That's, that's less a ringing endorsement for the POMB statute SB 26 than I, than I would have guessed. So, um, I'm not quite sure what the like means in that, uh, but people choose words carefully. Um, and so that uh, must indicate that there's some uh, give and take, take with respect to uh, SB 26. The rest of the report is is a is just a summary, really, of uh, of various um, uh, various positions taken and the and the presentations made and the and the spreadsheets that were run uh, uh, showing the outcome of various scenarios. Um, uh, that were run for members in, in October. I will say the one piece that I found interesting and, and useful, uh, there, the, the, the working group got divided into three subgroups uh, focused on uh, various alternatives. One was uh, the leftover approach. Uh, one was uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the $1,600 approach, just a fixed, fixed amount approach. Um, and the third was uh, the statutory dividend, as is, and they and they studied uh, they studied those. And and one of the one of the best parts of this document is the position statement uh, that uh, Representative Jonathan Chris, Jonathan Chris Tompkins and Senator Shelley Hughes uh, came out with with respect to the um, with respect to the statutory dividend. It's a multi-page document. Really does a good job summarizing. Uh, that position, the pros and the cons, um, summarizing what that position to 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 maintain that position, what it would take uh, on the other side of the budget in terms of revenues and spending, um, has a good uh, a set of uh, references to documents that that support the positions, and frankly, it's a very uh, it's a it's a document that I'll go back to a lot to sort of be sort of the baseline of what's going on with the with the PFD and and various reference documents about the PFD. The other two summary reports, uh, one on the sixteen hundred dollars set amount PFD and the other on the on the leftover uh, uh, PFD, are not. Uh, anywhere near as good as the document on the statutory PFD. So it's a it's a useful document, uh, but I think it, it 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 reflects that the that the working group did not achieve the objective of providing uh, uh, an opportunity to for a small subset to come together and and uh, and chart a way forward. There's there's nothing in this document that that leads you to believe that there's any sort of consensus coming out of this group about the. Uh, Excuse me about 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 the way forward. Well, and I, and I think uh, I think it was James Brooks that basically said, you know, again, this is a microcosm of what we've seen on the legislative floor already. I mean, really, that we have our camps; they are divided. Uh, the leftover, the fixed amount, no PFD, statutory PFD. We've got our factions and our camps, and really, nobody is willing to you know to bend much, uh, and uh, you know, and really you know, kind of take that middle ground, or at least have a discussion on it, and it's what's gridlocked us here for the last four years. And if this is any indication, probably is what we're going to be looking at this year. I mean, even though, I mean, something has to happen, but I don't know if they're going to find the the uh, the chutzpah to, to be able to move beyond this. 
No, I, I, it, it certainly doesn't indicate that they that they found it yet. And and as I say, it was this subgroup was looked at looked to as uh, as as a mechanism to try to you know form a, a, a core consensus or a core set of compromises that could lead the way forward. Certainly, it certainly doesn't do that it, it, in this document, at least. Um, Senator Giesel had said in uh, in her remarks to the Resource Development Council that. Uh, uh, she thought this group might uh, might be the springboard to, to finally getting the issue settled um, uh, this coming session. Well, if it's a springboard, it's a string, springboard to an empty swimming pool with the concrete <laughs> at the bottom. I, it, Swan dive. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I just don't see I just don't see anything in this document that, that leads uh, or in the in the in the statements made uh, around the around the table that that leads to to the to the um, uh, to the sense that, that this group was able to form a consensus at one point, um, and I and I commend Shelley Hughes for this. At one point, um, Shelley I think was tried to do that uh, for her part by saying, "Look, she could live with um, uh, she could live with uh, a POMV fifty fifty, uh, which is a restructuring of the of the permanent fund from the current statutory uh, pr- provision to to splitting the." The, the POMV draw 50-50 between the PFD and uh, and the um, uh, and and government, um, and then in another forum, not in this working group, but in another forum, Shelley talked about you know raising revenues uh, in in another way you know, through sales taxes that would help facilitate uh, coming to some resolution. And I think Shelley, frankly, was acting in the spirit. Of, of what this working group was supposed to be doing, providing this this smaller forum for to to, to to get a consensus together and then sort of springboard from that. Right. But I but you never you you, you never saw you never saw saw a reciprocal uh, a reciprocal uh, olive effort branch. by right. by the by by the other side. Yeah. No olive branch. You know she she would reach out, but they would just basically leave her hanging. Uh, in the middle of the pool, so to speak, when it was all said and done. Yeah, exactly right. And Jennifer Johnson, I mean, just sort of put the dagger through that by saying that that they're just I, I, I recall I don't recall her exact words, but basically it was there's just not enough money um, uh, for government uh, if you do a, a POMV fifty fifty. The the number has to be much smaller than fifty percent to go to the PFD. And that was just I mean, well, that's the end of that discussion. I mean, right? It's it, it wasn't there, there was just. I, the, the, in theory, you get a smaller group together. Uh, they sort of come from the different branches, the, the 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 pieces of the legislature on this issue. You 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 set them down. You you give a you, you put somebody like Click in charge who uh, has a history of sort of molding things together. Uh, and in theory, that's you know that's what they were trying to achieve. But and I and I again I commend Shelley for 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 taking for for taking that spirit. Uh, to heart and uh, and making what I think were were good proposals out yeah. there, but just, it just didn't come off. I, mean, I think Brad, uh, you you pretty much nailed the the nailed it on the head here with this whole working group thing. I mean, I I said it from the very beginning. Uh, I thought the fix was in, um, but I was impressed. Shelly Hughes, like you said, took to it uh, like a duck to water. She took to it uh, in the spirit in which it was intended, which was to do her best to articulate the position she was given and to figure out the pros and cons and, and, uh, to give credit to her and representative Christ Tompkins. They, uh, they seem to really pull it together and, uh, and come out with it with a, you know, a good solid recommendation. Um, and, um, uh, you know, good, good for them. Good for them on this one. I don't know how much good it's going to do them, but good for them. Well, I mean, it, it, we are going to get this issue solved sometime in the next fifty years. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's going to be the front end of the fifty years or the back end of the fifty years, but right. but we are going to get it solved. And and it, and you know, sometimes these efforts, sometimes an effort like this, uh, pays dividends down the road in the sense of somebody goes, well, you know, you said back there such and such. And the more I thought about that, you know, the, the the better it sounds. So why don't we take that as sort of a, a a starting point, and why don't we see if we can build something about that? And and even though that doesn't happen uh, in the working group uh, or in the in the initial effort, it happens later down the road. It happens a couple of months, couple of years, but but sometime uh, sometime later down the road. 
and and maybe that's the benefit of of that that we can go back to for this working group. As I say, the paper that Senator Hughes and, and Senator Christ Tompkins did uh, on um, on on the statutory dividend is is an excellent paper, and and it will sit there. And Shelley's ideas about Shelley's idea about POMD fifty fifty will sit there. And and maybe we'll move uh, maybe we'll move forward from that. I mean, there were there were other proposals. Adam Wool uh, was was hell bent on trying to move the PFD from uh, from being based on the permanent fund over to being based on oil revenues. Uh, essentially, you know, now now that we've run the permanent fund up, and now that we you know took everybody's uh, uh, the, the 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 proceeds from from the commonly held oil, and we've put it into the permanent fund. And now that oil's sort of on decline in terms of price and in production, you know, sort of the bait and switch. Ah, oh, you thought you were going to get the permanent fund, but now you're going to get oil. That's right. That was that was Adam Wool's Adam Wool's proposal, and, um, and and you know that so that sort of sits out there. That 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 had, as far as I can tell, that had no support from anybody else. Uh, but that sort of sits out there. So there are some things that 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 got got bandied about in this working group that maybe will get legs later on. But in terms of this working group producing a consensus that then can form the core of an approach going forward to get this issue resolved, uh, it, uh, it it didn't do that at all. But let's move on to number two, which is the oil tax initiative. Uh, I've been talking about how I'm very concerned about uh, oil taxation being regulated by an initiative because it's such a uh, – it's a non-transparent process, and it doesn't take into account many, many factors. It's like trying to uh, uh, do brain surgery over Skype. You know, you just—it's—it's it's a hard deal to do. Um, Brad, what's uh, what's your take on it? Well, Nick Begich, uh, the Republican Begich <laughs> of, right. of the Begich family, uh, has a piece in the ADN that I think uh, does a good job capturing uh, where we are on the issue. The uh, the headline of the piece is "Oil Tax Changes Require More Careful Consideration." It sort of adopts the same argument uh, that you just articulated, which is these things are very hard to do by uh, by initiative, and and outlines sort of the fundamental problem that I have with the initiative. Uh, we, we've talked about this on the show before, but but in the last year of the Walker administration, Ken Alper, who's who's a member of the of, of the group pushing the initiative, Ken Alper was the director of tax. Uh, for the Walker administration, there was a bill up in the legislature to change oil taxes, and in uh, in sort of his final summary presentation on that proposal, uh, uh, Ken had this to say. He said, "Major um, oil and gas ta- taxation should be based on fair share and related economic development issues, not budgetary need in any specific year. Major oil and gas tax changes should be backed by substantial analysis." And review, looking at both unique local factors as well as global comparables, and we don't have this initiative doesn't have anything approaching uh, a major, uh, substantial analysis uh, and review that 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 does an economic analysis of 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 what uh, uh, impact uh, these uh, uh, oil tax changes would have. Uh, on on Alaska's uh, uh, position, going, economic position going forward, it doesn't look at what the knock-on effect of raising taxes 300 production taxes 300 percent, which is what what this proposal would do. Uh, it doesn't have any analysis of the knock-on effect on economic development on 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 future uh, oil and gas development that the, that the tax would have, and 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 that's just not a responsible way to do taxes. You. You, you do taxes to raise revenues, but you're also concerned about what the effect on the economy is going to be uh, as, a, as a result of raising taxes. And there's just nothing, nothing in this uh, in this proposal that, that 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 indicates that any analysis has been done uh, or indicates uh, uh, where we would be uh, going forward if we enacted it. There, as you and I have discussed, there are places I think that we could that we could do improvements uh, uh, to the current oil and gas tax structure. A good example is uh, is taking into account the effect of the of the federal tax changes in 2017, which significantly reduced uh, uh, federal corporate taxes uh, on uh, on on corporations, and and is the major way in which the federal government takes money. Uh, out of the out of the oil stream, not only in Alaska but elsewhere, 
uh, in the United States. The, the 2017 tax changes reduced uh, the federal take um, and essentially left uh, that take over to uh, over to the corporations. I think there are changes that that we could make or should make to to our 20, 2014. Uh, oil and gas tax structure that responds to that federal to those federal changes and splits that um, uh, that sort of withdrawal or that increased take resulting from the lower federal corporate taxes uh, splits that between the the companies um, and the state in a, in an equitable manner. But that's not what this initiative does. This initiative does something wholly different than that and is really focused on just uh, a significant. Three, as I say, 300 percent, and as Nick says in his piece, uh, 300 percent increase uh, in oil and gas tax rates. And and this initiative isn't really malleable. I mean, you can't change an initiative once it gets going. As you sort of think through various issues, and you sort of try to try to say, okay, this was the corporate tax change. How do we how do we balance that uh, in Alaska? It, there's just no way to do that inside right. the confines of an initiative. Two years, right? One hope would be. One hope would be that this initiative triggers the legislature uh, to, 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 get, to seriously sit down and look at the tax structure. I think it's been five years, six years now since we did it. I think it's time to do it again, uh, to sit down, look at the tax structure, and, 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 and make, a, make changes that might be appropriate for the, for the events that have occurred during the intervening period. Um, but frankly, there's no indication the legislature is going to do that either. So I'm, I'm concerned we're going to go into the fall – um, uh, with the legislature not having act, enact, or acted on all tax changes, this sort of being the only thing out there, and we're going to get into uh, in, into a situation where people are going to say, "Well, we got to make some changes, and this is the only thing on the on the on the uh, on the platform, and so we're going to we, we need to vote for this to make to make those changes." I think that's just. I think that's just shooting ourselves in the foot, uh, and it's and it's concerning how this how this uh, uh, it, it, how how this whole process is playing out. Well, Bill Wilikowski does have a uh, bill SB one twenty nine, which is related to the oil and gas production tax tax credits. Relating, it's similar to the our fair share, uh, but it shows. Uh, I mean, I think again, it shows the complexity of that bill shows exactly how hard it would be to pass this by initiative and, and probably the unintended consequences of those things. So maybe there's still hope for some discussion this year on it if, if SB 129 actually makes it out onto the floor for discussion. I think it would be an interesting thing. We'll be following along with that. Um, finally, uh, you number three, uh, Ed King has got uh, a piece on projecting Alaska's budgets. we got about four minutes here, Brad. Ed King, whenever Ed King writes a piece, it's 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 worth reading. Uh, this latest piece that went up yesterday uh, is an analysis of of where he thinks Alaska's budget is is headed, not only from the standpoint of of this coming year, which is which is certainly important, but 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 frankly, the same thing I look at is is where are we headed over the next ten years. Uh, because what we do in any given year has some significance, but but what we do over a ten-year period has a has a huge amount of significance. And 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 as Ed delved into it, he came across one uh, uh, interesting set of numbers that I think is is just fascinating to me. It, he looked back at at whether Alaska, what happened when Alaska went through this before, and he was looking particularly at the Sheffield administration, the 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 period of of price drops that we that occurred in the middle 1980s, uh, and how Alaska and how uh, the budget responded to that, and he finds he finds a fascinating correlation. What I find a fascinating correlation uh, between what happened during the Sheffield administration and in the years subsequent, uh, and what's going on now. It, there's a chart at, toward the bottom of this piece uh, that uh, is an interesting way to do a, to do an overlay. It 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 analyzes the slope or puts down the slope of what happened from 1975 to 2005 uh, and then overlays that with what's happened from 2006 uh, to 2020 and then makes a projection of what happens from 2020 uh, forward over over the remainder of a, of a similar period. And if you look at what happened from 1975 to 2005 and then look at what happened from 2006 to 2020, uh, you find this amazing similarity between between the two slopes that, that you started out during a period of low oil prices or low oil revenues. You ramped up during a period of high oil revenues. 
and then you had as 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 Alaska did in the mid 1980s, and as we have in the in the mid 2000 teens, uh, you find oil prices dropping and uh, and and revenues dropping for for Alaska. I saw this parallel here, and I was just like, wow. Uh, and his his assertion is essentially that inflation. If we hold it down, we'll eat into this over the next ten years. But the deficits are still pretty real. So I mean, this is a—it's—it's it's interesting to look at. But what does it give us in the end, in your opinion? Well, I think I think his, the point he's making is that is that you can drop spending to a point, but then then those who who uh, are injured from from reduced government spending sort of push back, and you enter into this stalemate period. Which, in the case of Sheffield, lasted uh, post Sheffield lasted ten years, and you sort of are you're able to hold the nominal level of spending equal, which means inflation is sort of eroding the real uh, level of spending, but you're not able to drop the real level of spending, um, uh, the nominal level of spending any further. Uh, that that you sort of reach this equilibrium, this stalemate situation, uh, and and you've got to deal with it. And I think I think that. That analysis is 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 showing up in the current period as well. I mean, Governor Dunleavy tried to do- drop it a lot, uh, tried to drop it by over a billion dollars, uh, the nominal level of spending. He got uh, he got some of that done, uh, but there was tremendous pushback, and we've sort of entered into this stalemate. the uh, The challenge uh, with uh, with the current period is we have no savings to fall back on. <laughs> Um, and so to, to maintain this stalemated level of spending, we've got to have additional revenue sources that come from come from someplace. Right. And that means we're either we're either going to take it from uh, uh, the stalemates, either going to be funded by PFD cuts, which is a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's going to be funded by uh, uh, ERA, ERA withdrawals or additional savings withdrawals, which is a tax on future Alaskans. Or it's going to be funded by uh, an other tax uh, that's hopefully more equitable uh, on current Alaskans to pay for the government they have. But but from the spending side, I think this is a uh, an excellent analysis uh, in in going back in history and saying, look, where these things land is you land with a stalemated uh, a nominal level of spending that's eroded through inflation, but but you don't get it cut any further than that. The the forces of of, of those who are tied to government spending are strong enough to sort of essentially push you into this stalemate over an extended period. Right, because we've seen this crisis play out, uh, you know, several times already, and each time the sector that, again, protects that government spending is very, very strong, and they really, you know, you, you can only cut to so far uh, before they entrench, and uh, without, you know, a backhoe, you're not going to be able to get in there and get any more deeper into the into the digging. Yeah, and the stalemate is they don't they don't increase spending. I mean, those I think we're going to see this session and subsequent sessions a pushback by those who want to increase, you know, sort of re- re- reduce or or re- re- reverse the the cuts we've seen to the to the to the university. Uh, I think we're going to see pushes for increased spending on various other things. The the capital budget people will try to increase the capital budget. So this tells us that that it sort of stalemates both ways, right? Those who want to those who want to you know push back and increase spending will be stalemated, but but those who want to reduce the absolute amount of spending further will also be stalemated. And 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 I think that's you know you can see those forces at work right now. You can see those those other uh, those those other uh, uh, consequences right now. You you can see you know as we were talking earlier, Governor Dunleavy's administration sort of withdrawing from the battlefield. Um, taking over, uh, pushing itself to the side, and letting the legislature go at it. We can see in the PFD working group that there was a stalemate there. They weren't able to reach a consensus on an alternate approach. Uh, and I think stalemate is sort of the is sort of the the the, the status quo that we're gonna that that, that we very likely may see st- uh, play out. But as I say, that means we got to come up with revenues because we're out of savings to be able to fund it. So we're going to be taxing somebody. Uh, the question now, I think, that we move to is even in this stalemate mode, who are we going to tax to to maintain the stalemate? Well, we could tax you, we could tax me, but let's tax the man behind the tree, right? That's uh, I mean, that's <laughs> I, I think that's what the, the the juggling act now becomes is who who do we tax? It's not us, which is already the game that people I think like Senator von Imhoff and others are playing. 
uh, they want to tax the you know the the, the broad base of, of lower income Alaskans rather than their top twenty percent. They don't want those people to leave because they feel like those people drive the economy. Yeah, that's their argument certainly. And, but but two things about that. I don't think I don't think the if we if we adopt the kind of approach that Governor Dunleavy outlined in the uh, scenario five, the balanced approach, I don't think the level of tax that we see out of that to fund 500 million is enough to push uh, to push people out of the state. I mean, th- those people are in the state for a reason because they got jobs, they got businesses here, uh, because they've got homes here, they've got family here. Um, I don't think you see the same sort of flight uh, or the or the the type of flight that you know some predict um, uh, off of a off of a fairly low level uh, but equally spread. Uh, tax, and I don't see you, and I don't think you see. If it's a broad-based tax, I don't think you see. Think you see uh, the same sort of adverse impact on the economy that, uh, that some people claim. So, I I think there's a solution there, uh, but certainly nobody nobody wants uh, nobody is is voluntarily stepping up to it, um, and and there isn't a good forum. The working group proved there really isn't. Nobody's figured out a good forum to be able to uh, to come to the table on uh, on finding what that solution is. Right. Well, if we can find some more cuts, great. I mean, Ed King even said that there's still a billion dollars more spending than there was just 16 years ago. I think there's still some room, but we got to find the political will to do it. Otherwise, we've got to frame the conversation. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. My friend, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.